new Contemporary Moral Issues. I'm Professor Borrowdale, and uh, today we're reviewing for the uh, second exam. Um, is there anyone who plans to take the exam today, right after class? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's good about it. Uh, I'm going to need a few minutes to tinker with the, uh, uh, with the exam because of the way the new Moodle imports questions, so um, it'll be up, I, I'm going to say by 3.30. So um, that's that's uh, will be available at 3:30 today. Uh, we're going to review for that the first part of class. Second part of class talking about uh, gender equality, women's rights, the feminist movement, and so on. So, and then on uh, uh, next week we'll be talking about uh, gay marriage and affirmative action. Question? Oh, thank you. So. Um, that will be next week, and I think in the order, I'll have some resources up later today. I think, um, I don't know which one I want to take first, the, the gay marriage or, or uh, uh, affirmative action. Maybe we'll do the gay marriage first. I have a feeling, I don't know, what, which, is, which is more controversial, sex, sex or race? <laughs> I guess we're going to be talking about, uh, um, well, why don't we do, well, let's do affirmative action uh, the, the first, and then, um, and then we'll talk talk about um, gay marriage, and that might be a good good segue to talk about uh, morality and sexuality, so that would be another interesting thing we could talk about. I'm sure attendance will be up, you know, it being spring and everything, uh, or maybe not. Maybe people will be uh, out and about doing uh, spring-like activities, like the feral cats in my backyard. Uh, okay, so um, let's begin with... Uh, Do you say shoot What's that? You say shooting feral cats? No, no, I said like the feral cats in my oh. backyard you, who are uh, multiplying this time this time of year. I hear them yowling out there in the, the backyard. I'm trying to catch them and get them all fixed. And not going well. <laughs> Should we be doing that to humans? Are humans multiplying out of control? I think they do get like cats. <laughs> cats get pretty bad. So uh, let's talk about some terrorism. Uh, Oh, what do I do here? Where's that magnifying thing? Mm. There we go. I'll just do this. There we go. That worked out well. <laughs> All right. Jumbo size. Reader's digest size. Anybody look at the Reader's Digest most trusted person? That's all like a bunch of movie stars. And... Uh, you know, some people talk about it as if that's worse than it being politicians. I, I take heart that a lot of the politicians made the latter part of the role and some didn't make it at all. But, but still, it's, uh, I suppose you could have said trusted for what? This is Reader's Digest probably a lot of, um, no offense to any Reader's Digest uh, readers out there, but tend, tend to be, uh, you know, uh, an older demographic, let's say. The, the large print uh, edition is very popular. Let's say. It's a good place to get published, by the way. Now, now I guess it's easier to publish your own stuff on the internet. I remember back, back in the day that, that uh, if you wanted to get something published, Reader's Digest was the easy place to break in. All right, so um, my iPad here. What motivated the perpetrators of the Boston Marathon attack? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was a, a, religious, a religious fundamentalism, a, a radical version of, of Islam. Uh, the attack was carried out with a couple of pressure cookers. And all this stuff is in like the news stories I posted. Um, how might the attack have been prevented? Uh, were there any failures of law enforcement, intelligence, national security systems, or is this, was this an unforeseeable tragedy? We should stop selling pressure What's that? We should stop selling pressure cookers. Yeah, ban, some, ban on pressure cookers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be well, one way to do it. I mean, it's going to play everyone as a terrorist, spell their name right. There's no uh, background check required for you know, B-Rock and Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. They're all 
all pretty. Uh, We're not going to have to spell this guy's name. Right. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you hear it on the radio and it's like in and television, and then you read it in print, and it takes a while to like say, "Hey, that's." I think that's the same guy, except for it's spelled with like a T Z, and it's it's pronounced Joker <laughs> or Joker, and it's you look at it and like, how do they get Joker out of that? It's a carryover from a Cyrillic alphabet, so they yeah. Um, but with regard to failures of law enforcement, the, uh, the FBI had been tipped off by the Russians to watch this guy, and they had gone and interviewed him, put him on a, a list that contains a lot of people, but then decided there was nothing to indicate he was a threat, and that was over, I forget, two years ago or one or two years ago. Somewhere. Yeah, they closed the case on him, so they yeah. just sort of left him on the list and forgot about him. Uh, so uh, there's also the uh, we got, we got actually got a couple of tips from the the, the one of the terrorist brothers and the, the mom too, um, and from the, his mother? Uh, about his mother. She's terrorist. She's on the terrorist watch list oh, yeah, too. Okay, okay. I thought you meant she had called him. No, no, no. She didn't. No, no. She's uh, she seems to be on board with what was going on. We also got some info from Saudi Arabia too. Right, so uh, what we, we got the Saudi Arabia said, watch out for these <laughs> these people; they're terrorists, and and they were actually denied entrance into uh, um, into the uh, the Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the brothers wanted to do a pilgrimage to Mecca, and the Saudi said, uh, "No, I don't think so. You're not. You look like one of those dangerous radical types." And all, so, although the um, you know the Saudi government. Uh, has a lot of oil money, and they do give it to madrasas that, that do um, uh, preach a fundamentalist version of Islam. The Saudi government also, uh, you know, is concerned about terrorism and, and is an ally with the U.S. on the war on terror. So it's sort of this, this delicate balancing act that they do. On the one hand, they support that you know, they support the religion and particularly the Wahhabi version of it, which tends to be associated with radicalism. On the other hand. Um, they, they don't want people blowing up stuff in their own country and don't want to be blamed for terrorism. And so, um, you know, there's, there's you know, a vigorous debate about, you know, the Saudis and their role in, in, in terrorism and, and uh, whether they're friend or foe or sort of a mixture. And I think pro I would say uh, a sort of a mixture. Um, let's see. Oh, you had your yeah, hand up. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Okay, uh, go ahead, Codgegrove. Is that big enough for you to see? Yeah. Okay. Is the answer to the question, how might the attack have been prevented, is simply we could have followed up on Russian and Saudi warnings? Right, so we should have, could have followed up on the Russian and Saudi warnings. <laughs> um, also, um, it shows that... You know, it shows a problem with our, our um, immigration system. So first of all, the FBI got the warning. They did follow up. What did they do? They just, they interviewed him. What does that mean? They went up and asked him, are you a terrorist? We've got this warning from the Russians. And he says, oh, no, I don't have anything to do with terrorism. And they say, okay. And I, it, it, it's not clear, like, uh, whether any in further investigation was done. It doesn't seem that there, there was. They could find no evidence of an operational plot. And so they... Um, they, they stopped there. Now, in the, one of the things they might have done to avert the plot is instead of going to him and interviewing him, they could have uh, had they could have gone sent some operatives p uh, posing as Al Qaeda and said, "Hey, do you want to blow up uh, the Boston Marathon?" And if he said, "Yeah, that sounds great," they could have hooked him up with a phony bomb, uh, had him press the trigger button, swarmed in there, and arrested him and, and sent him away to prison, as they did with this guy who. Um, who was arrested in Portland for trying to blow up the Christmas tree lighting ceremony. So that's uh, the Muhammad Muhammad guy who's in a, a story. And so, but they didn't do a sting operation. They, they so that's, that's sort of a, a failure of, of the FBI, of our uh, law enforcement. Um, now, intelligence and national security, you know, didn't seem, seem like they, they did enough to, to uh, uh, do something about this person. And again, there's this sort of wait and see thing. Oh, as long as you're act not actively plotting a terrorist plot, pretty much you can say whatever you like. And and some people say, well, that's just, you know, First Amendment. But when you're dealing with, like, you know, uh, posting jihadi videos and talking about blowing up stuff and, and uh, celebrating um, uh, jihad and radical clerics and so on, uh, you, you might argue that that crosses the line to... Um, you know, supporting violence and, and uh, the overthrow of the government. Yeah. Didn't Muhammad claim that the FBI kind of encouraged 
moved him further than what he would have normally right. done on his own, his actions on his own? Is that his, what his appeal was? Right, so he, he uh, so this is a later question. Uh, Muhammad Muhammad, uh, who's the, the guy who um, tried, the, so he's accused of, of uh, terrorist act, namely that he thought he was gonna blow up uh, the people at the Christmas tree lighting ceremony up in the, the public square in Portland. Now it turns out that there was no bomb, it was actually a phony device set up by the FBI, and the people he was talking to, who he thought were terrorists, were actually uh, FBI agents. Uh, yeah, Tommy. There's like more stories that I heard this like radio interview with this this guy was an FBI informant and he started hanging out at this mosque in Southern California and they were all peaceful Muslims and he started continually saying, "Whoa, what about jihad? What about you know violent acts? Let's overthrow like these Americans are oppressing us." And he was the only one, the informant that is, was the only one encouraging attacks and he was from the FBI so, yeah. so there, there's always this argument that if, if you you know fall for a sting operation that it was entrapment but in trap in order for there to be entrapment um, it has to be the, the you have to show that you had no predisposition to do it so if that's the case as, as you say it then that might be a case of entrapment and there's always the worry that if you um, go around saying hey we're from Al Qaeda you want to blow something up that you might actually be creating terrorists in the process but the idea is, when you find somebody on their radar list, you want to say, "Hey, are you a terrorist?" Because then the person, you know, if they're planning anything, they go, they go to ground. They're going to be secretive in their behavior and so on. So the idea is, you go to them and you say, Psst, "Hey, I heard you're into the jihad thing. You want to blow something up?" And the guy says, "Yeah, let's do it." Then you're like, "Okay, that guy's dangerous. We need to take him off the streets." You set him up with a phony crime, and then instead of blowing up real people, he presses a, a button on a fake bomb, and then you arrest him. And the idea is that as long as you're not just going to some person in the street corner, it was like, you know, who maybe looks like they might be, uh, uh, you know, somebody who might be of the Islamic faith, and you ask them if they want to blow something up. They had reason. He was talking with a, a radical cleric, so they had reason to suspect him already because um, he was exchanging emails from this uh, 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 Known or known or suspected terrorist, uh, Matthew. On the note, uh, entrapment is uh, an entrapment defense or appeal is very, very seldom won. <coughs> but just like you said, you have to show you have no previous uh, disposition. So the Mohammed Mohammed guy, uh, the way the FBI had, had uh, even picked up, came up on the radar was they were monitoring jihadi websites and he was posting sort of solicitations to try and join try and get trained, join a radical movement, and that's what they responded to. So he, he had actually solicited to, to try and become an operative, and they sent in a, you know, a Middle Eastern uh, FBI agent to, like, hey, we're here to you know, work with you. That's how I got him. But, I mean, it wasn't like he's playing video games and a little pop-up comes up and says, hey, you care to join the jihadi movement? And he's like, well, I never thought of it before. You know, he was out there actively trying to join jihadi movements, and that's how they got caught. And they, they, they monitored jihadi websites, you know, as well they should. So. Yeah, the police will do things sometimes, like they'll um, have a car, and the car will be um, unlocked with the keys in it, and they'll sit there and wait until somebody, like, comes up, looks around, gets inside the, the car, and tries to drive it off at which time all the locks in the car go down and uh, the car, you know, goes over to, pulls over to the side of the road of its own accord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, and so that's, it's legal for the police to do that because the, the idea is that a car with the keys in it isn't an irresistible temptation to your average law-abiding citizen, but it is to a person predisposed to criminal behavior and that no one is going to get in a car and try to drive it off and steal it just because it's sitting there with the keys on it unless they're already a criminal. And so in the same way, if there's evidence that a person is predisposed towards terrorist acts, sometimes the FBI will go in and uh, attempt to get this person, uh, you know, try to, I want to use the word entrap because that's, that's illegal, but they'll try to bait the person, right? They'll, they'll launch a sting, op sting operation. Deal with hookers, too. Yeah, the same deal, right? <laughs> so it's a, um, and you know, there's, I suppose, there's, there's arguments about uh, whether or not you know, the, the, the police should be doing that, whether they should be, uh, in, whether they should be uh, 
launching sting operation, trying to lure people into criminal behavior that have shown a, a disposition uh, to it. And certainly in his trial, he's arguing it's illegal tra entrapment. And one of the problems, too, is that he wasn't allowed to confront his witnesses in open court. Um, two of the guys were there. They were actually in court, but they were under pseudonyms. So the um, defense wasn't allowed to know their real names. So they're just known by their first names, like Yusuf, Yusuf and, and Hussein. And uh, the judge ruled that the uh, FBI's, um, you know, the government's uh, justification for keeping their identity secret uh, overruled the uh, defense's need to find out who they are to sort of, I guess, you know, dig dirt up on them or show that they're, you know, try to impeach their credibility and so on. Um, so those, those are the issues that, at, uh, at when he appealed for a new trial and he was uh, denied. So it was uh, entrapment and his ability to face his, his accusers. accusers. Oh, there was also, um, I mean, one further thing was the access to the emails from, originally from this cleric and the, the defense was arguing that this guy wasn't in fact a terrorist, but the judge said that was irrelevant to whether or not uh, you know that whether or not the 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 trial was fair or not that um, the, all the emails you know whether, whether or not the uh, person he was talking to was an actual terrorist or whether he was wrongfully accused it just still the the FBI had reason to s suspect that the guy was uh, involved in terrorist activities all right um, yeah. was this the only attack they Let's see. I think I, they, oh, the other thing is is uh, our immigration system. Did I put an immigration on there? Uh, where they fail law enforcement intelligence. How can I lift off immigration? Well, I'm adding immigration. <laughs> so um, one of the things the United States does is we accept um, refugees from countries all over the world. And one of the reasons you can get into the U.S. is through political asylum. Now, sometimes people who get asylum from the U.S., you probably most of the time they're there because um, they live under unjust tyrannical governments. So there are people agitating for democracy uh, in China. There are uh, women, uh, although if you're a woman who uh, doesn't want to be forced to have an abortion, you can't get asylum <laughs> uh, in, in China. But if you're like at, involved in political activities trying to make China more democratic, less oppressive, uh, crusading for individual rights, you get on the government's uh, hit list, and then if the government's after you, you can apply for asylum in America. The same thing with, with you know, third world hell holes and dictatorships all over the, the globe. Now, uh, sometimes it's the case that people who uh, are on the government's uh, list are people who are engaged in things that would be bad for the U.S. too. So often from Middle East countries, a person who's on an autocratic government's list or involved in you know, radical religious uh, activity. So they're, they're uh, one of the, the jihadis or they're uh, looking uh, to install an Islamic government and um, involved in terrorist activity. And so it's, you know, it's difficult to figure out who's, which is which, right? So the US government sort of tries to do a little investigation, but lets on a lot of people who may be on on these uh, the list of, of governments like in the Dagestan right it might be that the government of Dagestan uh, or the Russian government you know so it, it may be the Russian government had good reason um, to have uh, the, those two brothers on their uh, lookout list and for them to be worried about the Russian government why because they're plotting against the Russian government I, and they come over here and what are they're doing they're they're plotting terrorist attacks against Americans so so that uh, being careful that you're not letting in uh, you know, terrorists into the country and taking people from areas where there's a lot of uh, uh, radical and extremist a activity, uh, you know, is, is, is a big risk. And some people would argue that not enough is done to keep an eye on people. Yeah. yeah the, the immigration forum, they've seen that before with people who are applying by, they're, they're hideously dated. I mean, they, they don't ask, or maybe they've updated them in recent years, but you know, a few years ago I looked at Wayne, he was asking things like, you know, were you ever affiliated with like the Soviet Communist the Party? The and Shining like, Path or something. And, and, no, and, and like the Gestapo. It literally yeah. it asked about like World War II era and Cold War 
questions and you're like, stop. Sure, keep that on there, but it's kind of a, it's kind of dated. I guess that's what. Let's see. Um, Is there a Times Square bombing plan? Oh yeah, so that was the the, the 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 other attack they were planning after they were fleeing. They they it looked like they ran out of gas, so. Um, they were planning on driving all the way to New York and bombing Times Square at the time they were uh, stopped by law enforcement and there was that uh, gun battle that killed one of the brothers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they hijacked somebody's SUV and that's, I guess you're gonna hijack a car, you know, hijack a Miata or something. <laughs> don't, don't hijack a... Uh, let's see, what? Oh, the Canadian terrorists. So the Canadian terrorists, I, I just posted that article because it was something that happened within a few days of the Boston Marathon attacks, and it's more um, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, terrorists with um, um, you know, ties to uh, Islamic extremism. And um, it's just kind of interesting. Both of those things are happening uh, close, and then the thing about Muhammad Muhammad came up, uh, his uh, appeal also, uh, you know, within weeks of each other. Canada thing was unusual because it said that it was Al Qaeda working with Iran. Yeah. They were funneling money through Iran, and usually they're, they're different sects. So it just kind of showed that, despite the fact that you know, were they not fighting toward us, they they'd be probably slaughtering each other. If they're willing to work you know, with each other apparently to try and blow up a train in Canada. So was that last year? No, that was right after this. this yeah, kind of Iran is. Uh, yeah, Iran is, is Shia. It's where the most of the, the Shia Muslims live in Iran, and then uh, Iraq has a, a lot of Shia, uh, Shia a large Shia uh, uh, population too. And so uh, the Shias and the Sunnis don't get along, uh, but sometimes sometimes they will work together uh, for common cause against the the West. Let's see. Um, we talked about Muhammad. Muhammad, according to Middle East scholar Robert Spencer, is Islam a religion of peace? So, what Spencer says is that uh, there are many uh, there there are many peaceful Muslims, but the, the the core text of Islam can be quoted by radicals and extremists uh, to justify terrorism, and are in fact used to justify and motivate terrorism. So. Um, I think what, what uh, Spencer says that you look at Jews and Christians and he says you look at a passage and it talks about slavery. How do you sell? What are the rules regarding selling your daughter into slavery under Judaism? Well, there they are in the Old Testament. And he says you, you go to your average Jew and Christian and you say, why aren't you practicing slavery? Do you have any slaves? And, and people will say things like, well, that was sort of for back then and we've gotten more enlightened now. And he's hoping that that will be more the case in, in Islam, and you'll get a more uh, a, a larger embrace of modernity, that people will um, be influenced by secular and humanistic traditions, and essentially become more, more liberal or more progressive in their theology, as it was happened with, with Jews and Christians. Um, let's see. And he says that if you look at, at terrorism, you know, it's motivated uh, largely through, this, again, the uh, uh, adherence to a very uh, literal and fundamental interpretation of Islam. Um, the poll in uh, Moodle about uh, British Muslims and it showed there were large, large, um, a large uh, minority of people had sympathies towards for the seven seven bombings. Even though people said, "Well, I don't necessarily approve of it," they sort of said, "I I think there was a, an answer that said they they expressed sympathy sympathy towards." their act. So people say this, right? I don't really necessarily approve of it, but I understand where they're coming from. And then there was also a number of people, a smaller number that, that said they actually approved of it. And you get a um, large number of people too, a majority saying they want Sharia in uh, Britain, that they want Islamic <coughs> law to be the law of the land in Britain. Uh, the Pew study about attitudes worldwide you know, is, are, are much more um, varied, and it shows still there's sizable, um, sizable minorities and in some countries majorities that support extremist groups. And so you get that largely in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Palestine, 
in um, Egypt, uh, Nigeria, right? So you have large numbers of, of people in the Middle East, uh, North Africa, that say they support extremism. In Indonesia, it's, it's must, m m much fewer people. And you look at Eastern Europe, and it's even smaller. So it depends on the region you're looking at. And again, as, as someone mentioned in class, the majority of uh, Muslims don't live in um, don't live in the Middle East, and so and they're, they're not the ones involved in terrorism. And when you do get an act of terrorism, and say like the, the guy that bombed the nightclub in Indonesia, um, uh, or there's one in Australia, it, they tend to be imports from other areas. Um, although um, we also looked at the number of people. Uh, for the, one of the questions was, um, what should happen to someone that leaves their that, le that leaves their religion or leaves Islam? And you got like 30 percent of the people in Indonesia said they should be killed. <laughs> so, uh, although people also say there should be freedom of religion, I think it's within you know certain constraints. So you look at the number of people that say should there be freedom of religion, and are people in fact in your country allowed to practice their religion? Uh, most Muslims will say yes, of course. But then you say, well, can you, if you're, a, if you're born to Muslim parents, can you convert to Christianity? Oh, no, you, you should get the death penalty. Um, and there's also support for you know, anti-modernist views, um, like the stony of adulterers and, and the cutting off of hands and feet, which are in Islamic law. Um, and again, if you look in the Old Testament, there it is, stoning for adultery. Uh, do, do Jews today in Israel, are adulteresses stoned to death? No. Are adulteresses stoned to death in Iran? Yes. Are, does that happen in Saudi Arabia? Yes. So, um, you know, are homosexuals hanged in Iran uh, in accordance with the Islam, Islamic teaching against homosexuality? Yes. If you go to, you know, you look at like an American synagogue, like a reform synagogue, they'll have like a gay rights support group. I remember like when, um, when I was in uh, Syracuse, there was a, the local uh, um, reform synagogue, and Wednesday night they had like the, the the gay Jew support group, and then Thursday night they had a theme for Buddhist meditation. And so, if you look at the way you, Judaism has changed over the centuries, it's become very liberal, very progressive. It's embraced uh, not just you know not just modernity, but multiculturalism and syncretism and so on. Uh, yeah, Matthew. Do you remember at the UN a couple of years ago, and a reporter asked him about homosexuals, and, and he said, we don't have homosexuals in Iran. Right. They don't exist there. That's a Western problem. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just like born in alcohol. Well, it's cause, I guess because they're, they're executed. <laughs> Just saying. Those, those, those were outsiders. Um, so what, what, is, uh, um, what is modernity? So... Um, Modernity is made up of several different ideas. It includes uh, the notion of representative democracy, um, separation of church and state, free market capitalism, uh, the notion of individual rights and the importance of the individual. And the scientific method and the, the importance of reason are also part of it. So reason and scientific method, capitalism, uh, representative democracy, I'm backwards here, capitalism, I never said capitalism, uh, separation of church and state, and the, the, uh, the idea of individual rights. And so all those things you know, were, were present um, to a large extent in classical Greece and Rome, uh, after the Roman Empire fell apart, there's sort of, uh, people forgot about them. You had a bunch of kings and, and uh, despots and, and anarchy and barbarians. And they were rediscovered uh, by the West uh, during the Renaissance, um, ironically, again, by, uh, largely by um, people in the Middle East, uh, um, uh, predominantly Muslims, uh, copying their works and preserving them. Otherwise, they may have been, may have been lost to, to history. And so these texts are rediscovered in the West and in Italy and later on in, in the rest of Europe. There's sort of this flowering of civilization and people look back and wonder, you know, why did this happen? Well, it was 
uh, in part due to the influence of these ideas from classical Greece and Rome. Uh, humanistic ideas about the importance of life here on earth, the idea that the individual matters, that uh, the state exists to serve the individual, not the other way around. And um, so then the, the question is, why, why hasn't uh, the Islamic world by and large embraced modernity and uh, why is it associated with terrorism? And I think I put this as an, as a, uh, as an open question. Are, are there any aspects of Islam which might explain its failure to embrace modernity? Uh, yes, there are. <laughs> Um, and its association with terrorism in the modern age. So we, we talked about this. One is that um, in that Bernard Lewis article, uh, Lewis says uh, Muhammad was his own Constantine. Anyone what, know what he meant by that? Council of Nicaea. Constantine wanted to unify the Christian church because they were fighting each other in the streets and they lacked to unify the world. So he got together a council of bishops led by a man named Eusebius and they created the canon Christian Bible that we have today. Right. Oh, I don't know if created is probably not the right word for well, it. Well, yeah. okay. Sorted out amongst the many writings. They, they, um, they, uh, uh, there was a church council that he convened together to have an, uh, you know, an official list of the books that, that belong to the Bible. Um, so so what, is, what does uh, Lewis mean though? He says Muhammad was his own Constantine. Well, he eliminated all the other sects that were... Uh, Fraction, uh, fractionalizing of the Arabic culture, and he provided them with a common enemy and a common doctrine. Yeah, and, and I think that what Lewis is focusing on there is the idea that you know, Constantine is a Roman ruler. He's an emperor of the Roman Empire. He's, he's the, the emperor of Rome. And then you have the, um, the, the church, which is a separate entity, and Constantine is, um, you know, Involved in the church and it makes Christianity the state religion and so on, um, but in in Islam you have Muhammad. Muhammad is both a political and a spiritual ruler. He's both rolled into one. So, you know, uh, Jesus wasn't his own Constantine. Muhammad was. I mean, that's one way of looking at it, right? Jesus was um, a pacifist, uh, a itinerant preacher and exorcist and faith healer who wandered around Palestine, was uh, um, accused by the Jews of blasphemy. They got the Romans to execute him as a political rebel. And it looks, um, historical evidence looks like uh, Jesus what, didn't have any political aspirations at all, that he was uh, apolitical. And you know, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Um, he told people to pay their taxes. Uh, he said, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. My kingdom is not of this world, i.e. it's not a political kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom. He talked about a coming kingdom to come that was spiritual in nature. And so um, Jesus was apolitical. So um, Muhammad, on the other hand, uh, presided over a church state empire. And so when, when these notions of separation of church and state start to come about, um, that it's very difficult for them to take hold in Islam because of this tradition of uh, church and state being together, starting with the example of Muhammad, going to the caliphs. Um, you have a very close association or unity of the political and, and spiritual powers. Zach. What was the guy's last name? Bernard what? Lewis. Lewis. So that's the What Went Wrong article. It was a review of one of his books. Uh, by that title, and there's an interview which is a video, and also there's the text down if you want to just read the text and not have to, to listen to the, um, wait for the interview. <laughs> Although the, I don't know, it's, it's Brian Lamb and Book Notes, so the, the delivery style is not that exciting, so it's probably faster to read through. But it's nice to listen to if uh, you haven't already. So it's called What Went Wrong, and, uh, and there's an interview with uh, Bernard Lewis, both in, in Moodle there. Uh, let's see. He's a, a Princeton Middle East scholar of, of many years. Let's see. Um, so an, another difference with Judaism is that Judaism has faced centuries of oppression. And in the Jewish tradition, you have the, um, 
the Tanakh, the first five books of the Bible, and then the, the, the prop, prophetic writings and other writings. And then you have the Talmud, which interprets the, um, the, the Tanakh, uh, the, what Protestants call the Old Testament. And so the, since the, the Talmud was written later at a time where the Jews were, were captive in, in Babylon and under the, the thumb of the Babylonian Empire, you get a kinder and gentler version of Judaism and you get a kind of reinterpretation of these warlike passages. And through, through tradition, uh, Judaism, even if it's for, in its formative period, it becomes much more moderate. Whereas if, if you look at the, the formative period in, in Islam, it's much shorter and um, it's, it goes from being peaceful to being more militant. So in the, uh, the early verses written in, in, um, in Mecca, when Muhammad's trying to perceive persuade people through peaceful means and preaching, it's uh, much more moderate. It says everyone should have freedom of religion. Um, you should you know, uh, respect others' rights. You should try to preach peacefully. But then when um, he has to get out of Mecca because uh, they don't want him there anymore because they regard him as a troublemaker and he has to flee for his life, and then he, he gets a foothold in Medina and decides to change tactics and try to uh, take Mecca by force after being spurned by them, then you get these more militant verses and those come later. And so the idea is that the later verses tend to be what people go with because they're regarded, regarded as superseding uh, the early verses. And when, when uh, Islamic clerics look at the more peaceful Meccan verses and the later more militant Medina verses, what the, they have this, this uh, there's a doctrine in Islamic jurisprudence that the, the later verses supersede or take the place of the early verses. And whenever there's a conflict, you go with the later verses. Matthew. One thing I think missing there is uh, Judaism doesn't have this policy of converting people or proselytizing. That's, you know, when you look at the early Christianity, when it was, you know, wed with the Roman Empire and mm -hmm. also with Islam, you know, the idea is, like, spread it, spread right. it, turn everyone Christian, turn everyone Muslim. And Jews are like, just, hey, just leave us alone, you know, like, you know, they don't want to convert people, so that's, that's got to, you know, Yeah, there's even, like, a big, there's a big reason not to convert, you know, the <laughs> circumcision, right? So, uh, it's, you know, as a, and people would convert, so in, in, uh, under the Greek Empire, you had people... Um, even in New Testament times, called the God fears, and there people who actually converted from from uh, Greek paganism to uh, Judaism, but they were few and, and far between. And um, I suppose you might say that early on, the reason now they're not looking for converts is because uh, God told them to drive everybody out, and and the ones that won't leave, kill them, so and destroy all their religious artifacts and set their temples and and altars and so on. So. Um, but you're right, there isn't this, whereas in Christianity, there's a big focus on converting people. And, this, and the same, Islam has the same sort of thing. And it, this may be just because you get Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that because Islam, you know, in part, comes out of the Christian tradition, this emphasis on conversion might have been something that, that, gets, uh, that gets picked up. Um, it also just might be, um, you know, part of the sort of uh, cultural context that, um, you know, Muhammad's part of this uh, civilization of warring tribes, and you know it's kill or be killed. And um, the idea is you have all these def desert chieftains vying for power, and everybody's trying to get power over the other guy. And so Muhammad finally takes over and does what everybody else is doing, which is try to conquer as much territory as he can. And then Islam becomes a unifying force for people under his rule. And so it makes sense to spread that because the idea is if if people have converted to a religion which is caught up with the state, they're not going to rebel against the state because to rebel against the state is to rebel against God. It's you know similar to the divine right of kings, I suppose. Um, let's see. Another aspect is I talked about this um, earlier about the Renaissance. One of the big Renaissance innovations was banking and uh, be able to lend money at interest. And so in, in Florence, you had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a wealthy merchant class that emerged, and a lot of this came through being able to do, uh, to, to get out, take out a loan to uh, mount a sea expedition. And Islam has very strict rules against 
what they call usury, which is borrowing money at interest. Christianity did too, but there's sort of this caveat. Christians said you couldn't do it, you couldn't lend money to another Christian, but you could borrow money from a Jew. <laughs> and so uh, in uh, Islam, the prohibitions against uh, usury were, were more blanketed. And so it was difficult for, to do business and still is to some extent in the Islamic world because of all the rules about banking and lending to interest. <laughs> There's various ways, technical ways to get around it. Um, but, but that tradition there against lending money at a profit is something that, that wasn't present in uh, Florence uh, among Christians borrowing from Jews. And so um, that, that was one of the big uh, uh, forces in, that led to the Renaissance. I think I hit all the church and state. Um, what do the core texts of Islam say about religious violence? So one of the things I, I um, may not have hit as hard as I should, but that Islam says when you're fighting in the, the holy war against the unbelievers of jihad, uh, you can't kill civilians. You can't kill enemy combatants. So, um, so as you're fighting the war, um, you can't kill women and children. And so attacks on civilians, like terrorist attacks, right, uh, uh, seem to be forbidden by the texts. Now, what do the terrorists do about those texts? <laughs> well, so then they, they get really liberal about, you know, fast and loose about the texts. And the, the, essentially the argument of bin Laden and others is that uh, the people who are attacked are willful, willful participation, or willful participants in the war against Islam. So the idea is the West is fighting wars against Islam and any American who's a taxpayer who's not fighting against the government to try to overthrow it, you know, is implicitly agreeing with wars against Islam. And they elect people that, that uh, fight wars and, and send troops overseas and so on. And so um, the idea was that the people on 9-11 were collaborators with the enemy. And so that's, so that's and I think a, an objective person looking at those texts would say that's kind of weaseling around the, the text there. So. So it may be that, that, you know, by focusing on those passages, uh, you know, in the sort of propaganda or ideological wars, maybe you can make headway. Anyone else, anyone have any comments about that, about the... Um, so, um, but it also says uh, in the Quran that uh, you know, if you're a pagan and you're conquered by um, uh, Muslims, you, you have to convert to Islam. It's obligatory. So, um, so you know, many people were were uh, were killed in Islamic conquest because uh, you didn't get the cho choice to become a Jew or a Christian and live as a second class citizen. You had to convert or die. It's similar to you know the Old Testament, um, except for the Old Testament, you didn't even get a chance to convert. You were just killed. So I suppose you might see that as a more enlightened view. So, um, so if you're a pagan, meaning you're not a Jew or a Christian, your choice is convert or die. If you're a Jew or Christian, you can still keep your religion and live as a second-class citizen. You have to pay an unbeliever tax. Uh, there's prohibitions against you holding political office, and you know there are rules about riding a horse or owning a sword and so on uh, in different regions. Um, so, uh, and then if you leave Islam also, you, uh, there's a death penalty for uh, being in a pot, what they call an apostate. That's a term used in Christianity too. An apostate is a person who leaves leaves the faith. Um, so again, a, a kind of a mixed view. So um, fighting against the unbeliever uh, to spread Islam is okay, but you can't kill civilians. And um, it, again, if you're a, a, a pagan, you can be killed. But if you're a Jew or Christian, uh, you have to um, give the chance to live under Islamic rule and, and you can't do violence to what Muhammad called people of the book um, if they you know, don't rebel. Now, if you're rebelling against your Muslim rulers, then, then you can be killed. But um, if you surrender and you're a Jew or Christian, you get to live under Islamic rule. But still, there's this idea of you know, spreading your religion through, through conquest is something that Muhammad not only approved of, but you know, participated in. And this, you can find this in the Quran and Hadith and the, uh, the Meccan verses and, and pretty clearly in the, the Hadith. Um, what is Sharia? Sharia is Islamic law. 
Um, and it, it uh, is just the, um, the ruling of uh, clerics about the, what the Quran and Hadith mean. Um, what, and what, what does it say about the rules of warfare? You can't kill civilians uh, in the war. And what do the terrorists do about these passages? Well, they kind of, they, they try to kind of twist them and, and uh, say, well, you know, there's, there's civilians and then there's civilians, I guess. And I suppose, you know, philosophically, you might make an argument that, like, the U.S. Uh, bombed uh, factories in Dresden. They firebombed the city, right? And, and, and there's, like, women working, women and even children working in those factories and people that aren't soldiers working in those factories. But what are they doing? They're building munitions to kill Americans. Well, what do you do? Firebomb the place. And you kill a bunch of people who aren't uh, engaged in hostilities directly, but indirectly they're making war munitions. And so Bin Laden, by extension, says, you know, that people working in international, um, you know, buildings which support international trade and working in the American infrastructure for American corporations and so on are uh, funding the American empire and thus collaborators with it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, it says, are there similar passages in the Old Testament? And yes, there are. Right. And then it says, if so, why isn't there a proliferation of Jewish and Christian terrorists? Is that because of modernity? Right, because of Judaism's embrace of modernity. So the Jews were oppressed people for, for uh, thousands of years. Um, and in the formative period, even you look at, at Judaism, say maybe, uh, take some round numbers. If you put the Exodus at say 1400 BC, which is the kind of, a, kind of an early day for it, but it just go back, some people think it's like 1450 BC. You look from there to about maybe, um, I don't know, 900 is, is when you have um, Israel as sort of an identifiable political body. That's like 500 years. After that, the northern and southern kingdoms split. The northern kingdoms conquered by the Assyrians. Southern kingdoms conquered by the Babylonians. Then they're under the Medo-Persians. And then they're under the Greeks. And then they're under the Romans. And then they're scattered by the Romans and go, go all over the, the globe. And so Israel is a political, united political entity, you know, really only around for you know, 500 years at the most, maybe more like 300. And so there you get... Uh, um, a people who are in most of their history and a lot of their form, the formative history of their religion under the thumb of some other power. Well, when you're at the bottom of the pile, you tend to develop um, a value system that's sort of kinder and gentler. So uh, the philosopher Nietzsche talks about this. He talks about master values and slave values. And uh, in his book, Beyond Good and Evil, there's a little philosophy for you, a uh, little uh, ethics of a, of a kind of um, anthropological or, uh, and I suppose you might say nihilistic bent. But the philosopher Nietzsche talks about if you're a slave and part of a slave caste, caste uh, what's going to be important to you? What are you going to prize? Well, things like equality. Why? Because we're all in this together, and if we don't stick together, we're going to get squashed by our masters. Um, and so... Uh, and what, like, you know, the idea of, of, of freedom. Why? Because you don't have any. And the idea of humility. Why? Because if you're not humble, your master is going to squash you. So you sort of develop all the, all the values that a person who's living under the control of others would have. Uh, master values, on the other hand, have to do with, like, being ruthless and not letting somebody get away with something and keeping an eye on your enemy and doing unto him before he does unto you. And... Um, being ambitious and, and, and so on. And so if you look at the, the, the value system of an oppressed people, it tends to be more pacifistic. It tends to be let's all hang together. It tends to be a kind of kinder, kinder and gentler value system. And so centuries of oppression lead Judaism to be you know, a religion of education, of uh, love for your neighbor and yourself, of small communities that get together to worship God. Um, and, and so it becomes much more moderate. And, and that was the religion that influences Christianity. Now, you know, to be fair, during the Roman Empire, there were a lot of uh, Jewish terrorists around that time. 
Um, but they were still, you know, in a minority. So you had the, um, um, even a couple of, the, the uh, um, I'm blanking out now. The Zealots, right, the Zealots. So you have the, the, the and, and it looks like a couple of Jesus' uh, followers might have been former Zealots. Um, so you had the Zealots that eventually rebelled against Rome, and then uh, after a couple of rebellion, that was, rebellions, that was pretty much the end of, of Jewish terrorism until, I guess, the Nazis. Um, but you had uh, the, the, again, over centuries of oppression, the sort of wanting to bring Israel back together as a political entity, it doesn't work out, and finally the, the Roman boot comes down on the neck of the Jewish people, and, and, and finally the rule comes down, no more living in Jerusalem, and, and the Jews move all over the world where they, there's their dream of, uh, of having their, their, their Jewish state doesn't come to fruition until uh, 1948. So, so, all, so all these historical facts that can make, make Judaism into a more modern religion, right? Because there, a lot of Jews move into Western Europe uh, and, you know, under the Renaissance, they tend to be more uh, peaceful towards other religions because they got to get along with them because they're always in the minority, um, and then uh, Christianity you know, is more moderate for different religions, although Christianity has its dark past with the, the Crusades and the Inquisition. Uh, the people that did those things were in no way following the teachings of Jesus. Now, they might have been following some of his old teaching, the Old Testament teachings about genocide, but again, Jesus is a pacifist. He tells people to love their neighbor and love God. And you never see Jesus saying, uh, pick up a sword and conquer the unbeliever and make him accept your faith. So, um, hmm. so Homeland Security and the administration, how might they be ineffective in dealing with terrorism? Well, I'll give a few examples. There's these reports that come out about look out for the right-wing extremists and you know, returning war veterans, uh, people with uh, Ron Paul bumper stickers on their car, people that talk a lot about the, con about the Constitution, people who use the word tyranny uh, when applied to the federal government, people who talk about limited government and individual rights, uh, people who talk about sound money. So those people are, are you know, associated with, so those are kind of mainstream um, you know, beliefs of the, the Tea Party and uh, conservatives generally and libertarians too. And these are associated with white supremacist groups and militia groups and, and these sort of uh, fringe people that are, are pretty small in number. And when you have limited resources, when you put out reports like this saying this is what we need to look out for is it's the, uh, these white supremacists and the militia groups, um, you know, living in the ghost of Tim Timothy Bay, which was 20 years ago, um, you, you're not spending that time looking for people who've been perpetrating attacks for the last 20 years, um, which are, are the, the radical uh, jihadis. Um, and then you get Eric Holder. Uh, I posted the video clip of him not wanting to associate even the radical extremist uh, Islam with uh, terrorism. Um, and I, I talked in class too about the president growing up in Indonesia and um, having a, a lot of uh, uh, Muslim family members and even you know, friends at the University of Chicago, Khalid Rashidi, a big uh, uh, Palestinian activist. And this, did these things sort of have, have an effect on a person? And uh, the president seems to want to, to do everything he can not to make it look like the, the U.S. is at war with Islam. And it, to the extent of even you have FBI reports that were you know, purged of material which is uh, considered to be Islamophobic, and um, you know the name of, of you know, I'd say political correctness or trying to trying to be fair and so on, and all these things you know uh, feed into a climate of, of fear where a person is worried they're going to be uh, perceived as Islamophobic or bigoted in some way if they are really a, a big hawk on terrorism and, and making it, and are focusing on uh, Islam and, and terrorism and any connection between the two. And I guess the, you know, the, the, the view of these uh, two guys from, uh, from uh, Dagestan and their mother is like, well, they, 
they have these kind of extreme beliefs, but hey, this is America and you're free to practice your religion and they aren't actively plotting anything. So we'll just sort of let them do their, their thing. And there's nothing we can do until they actually commit a crime. Um, so what can we focus on more effectively? Can combat terrorism, um, focus on the immigration system, have greater scrutiny on, on people who are immigrating from uh, nations where uh, terrorism is big, particularly in the Middle East. Um, and you know, not let political correctness get in your way of, of taking a, a, an accurate view. So I like to present in this class, it's nuance is always hard. <laughs> But so what is the nuance? OK, sometimes like I teach religions of the Middle East. And I had students in this one class. And, and we're talking about you know, get to Islam. And, and uh, I think students will say, they attacked us. Who attacked us? The Muslims. <laughs> all Muslims? Uh, all, all Muslims attacked the United States on 9-11. And, and you know, that's what Osama bin Laden said. Osama bin Laden says the West attacked us first, and so we're attacking them. And he has that same sort of black and white thinking that it's this us against them mentality. And I hope nobody in the class gets that impression that um, I'm saying that, that all or even the majority of Muslims uh, are sympathetic towards terrorism. Um, on the other hand, there's, there's the other extreme, which is that Islam is a religion of peace. Anyone who draws any historical connection between Islam and terrorism is an Islamophobe who, who has, has it in for any member of the religion. But you got to kind of use your head. If there's a person who living in your community who's um, a Sufi uh, and um, he just goes about his, uh, his uh, religious beliefs and, and celebrations and uh, he hasn't done anything to make you suspicious of him, you, there's no reason for you to be suspicious of, of him. If, on the other hand, um, you know, your neighbor is posting uh, you know, videos of Anwar al-Awlaki or some of these radical clerics, or he's listening to radical Saudi preachers and, and posting messages on internet boards about the jihad, you see he's got the Inspire magazine in his mailbox, you know, maybe you ought to take a se second look. Maybe you ought to say something. Um, or if the person is expressing hatred for the West or saying that they're going to have to do something. Uh, about about um, Western imperialism, um, or they express even a person express the Jews or, or express the attitudes towards like the the conspiracy views about like uh, the Jews run the world and they're in collaboration with the U.S. government. And um, again, if they start saying, "Oh, we got to do something about that," then maybe you want to um, take a second look and uh, see whether there might be a reason to. Um, you know, call the FBI. Yeah. If we if we accept the premise that the majority of attacks are done by Islamic extremists, why don't we just profile? Well, that's a good question, and I, I would I would say that when you're dealing with limited resources, um, you're not net, you're not only profiling by religion because there's 1.2 billion Muslims, right? That's a lot of people to profile now. Probably few, fewer people, fewer of them immigrating to America, but you look at people. If you had a guy coming in from, um, I don't know, uh, Malaysia or uh, Indonesia, you might not want to look look at him uh, really closely. If you have a person coming in from Yemen, you definitely want to give that guy extra scrutiny, even if you have no reason to suspect that that. Um, that he's a, a terrorist. Why? Because Yemen is a hotbed for, for, for terrorism. Same thing with Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Egypt. And again, it's not to say that you deprive this person of your civil rights. It's just that you want to pay special attention to that person and people who fly on you know, airplanes and so on. And there's a profile, which is you know, young uh, Islamic males from certain countries, from, from the Middle East, that you know, got to pay special attention to. Um, and so that's, I, I think you make, it, make a good point. And I would suggest that that makes more sense to use limited resources in that way than to scan and radiate everybody to, to grope grandmothers and little children and, and the blue glove, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, 
going like this at the scanner um, because it's it's you know it's security theater and it's not likely to be effective. And then people, you know, one guy uh, has a bomb in his shoes and what do they do? Uh, now everybody's got to take out their shoes. Why? Because somebody might try to do it again. Well, chances are the terrorists are going to change their tactics and try something else because that, that horse is out of the barn and they're going to do something else. So then the, a guy hides a bomb in his underwear. So then what do you got to do? Well, you got to be scanned by the scanners for, so they can see your underwear so you can see if they got any explosives in it. And so it's always sort of one step behind and not doing a lot to actually produce security, but maybe giving people a false sense of security. Uh, Dave and then Matthew. It's also been proven that they hire people who are, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily the best person for that job. They've been shown to show uh, negligence in who they're hired. Right, so the bar is very low for, you think about it, it's a pretty, probably a pretty thankless job to work there. And so it's easy to get hired, but it's also like a, a you know, pretty good paying union job now and uh, a, you know, a huge cost to taxpayers. Uh, but the, the screening process is, has some uh, problems with it. Uh, yeah? I was just going to say one thing we, we really haven't gone into in much depth with the discussion of terrorism is how our country has let uh, the threat of terrorism erode our own civil liberty. Mm -hmm. And that's like, in, in a way, it's, it's like we, we handed it to them. You know, like, oh, we're going to screw with the Americans. Look, and then everyone consents to these, you know, this, the erosion of our civil liberties, like, unprecedented in a long time. I mean, at least, you know, maybe since the McCarthyism or, or you know, the, the Sedition Act under Woodrow Wilson. But, you know, we, uh, we essentially, you know, they passed the Patriot Act. What's the Patriot Act do? Well, we don't know because it's top secret and they won't tell us. But we know, like, you know, it, it allows all kinds of expansion of warrantless surveillance of people inside and outside of America. And you set up all these other intelligence apparatus domestically. I mean, when it comes to the point where, you know, like, Oregon Center, I think it was uh, Ron, was it Whitener or Berkeley? I think it was Ron White. He's a Democrat, for God's sake. And he says, oh, my God, he's on a intelligence committee, so he's not allowed to say what he sees, but he did say things like, if Americans had any idea what they're doing under these powers, you would be terrified, you know? And when you get a Democrat senator saying that, talking about the erosion of your civil liberties, you know it must be bad, you know, like. And so the, there was a big controversy over Rand Paul talking about uh, use of drones on American citizens, yeah. and he was, you know, sent a public open letter to Attorney General Holder and said, uh, will you say in, in unequivocal terms that the U.S. isn't going to use a drone strike on a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil? And Eric Holder said, well, we don't expect to do it, but we might need to. <laughs> and uh, you have the, the National uh, Defense um, Authorization Act, which says that anybody who's suspected of terrorism can be picked up off the street, American citizen or not, no charges, no due process, thrown in a cell. Indefinite, indefinite detention, and you know all the name of the war on terror. So that's something to you'll know, be worried about. But it's not only to be worried about; it's a complete and utter defiance of our constitutional principles, the, the very basis of law that our that our civil liberties are founded on. So I mean, it's, it's we've lost a lot from the war on terror, and I mean we've lost people. Uh, people have been killed by terrorists, but but the American people themselves have lost a lot of freedom, probably a lot more than we know about. You know. Yeah what's actually being monitored, what your own private things, that you should have a reasonable expectation of privacy and probably don't have any more. Right. Uh, Dave. Where is this money coming from to finance this um, security? Uh, American taxpayers. <laughs> Huge expense. Is it or, or are we borrowing borrow it from, from China, necessarily yeah. communist China? Yeah, it's printed, borrowed, and uh, uh, paid in taxes. So the, there's also, going back to what like, like, um, Matthew was saying, the um, uh, Cybersecurity Act that just uh, failed the, uh, it, it passed the, the House, but it failed the Senate, which is actually surprising. For the third time. Yeah, so, um, so this, and I suppose that's a good sign that, uh, and this was basically going to give private companies the ability to hand over your data to the government without telling you and uh, without uh, informing you of their policy and their, that they're going to do so uh, when, without the government having to present them with a, a warrant and to have zero liability for it. 
and thankfully that failed. But again, this was put forward on the need to protect against cyber terrorism. So a lot of your you know, rights are being eroded in the name of uh, fighting terrorists. So what is the you know what is the balance to be struck between civil liberties and and protecting American citizens? Uh, I'll leave that up to you to judge. And let's uh, on that note, let's take our break.